Hello, my name is Brian Harrison, and this is a presentation for the Antique Wireless Museum entitled Radios and the EEIS, the Enemy Equipment Intelligence Service in World War II. In 2017, at our local Antique Wireless Meet, I was lucky enough to find two radios that had come supposedly from a CIA man's estate. The top radio is a Radeon R3, which is a portable high frequency communications receiver with a BFO. I was most interested in the transmitter on the bottom. It's a 40 watt high frequency CW only transmitter, does not have the power supply, which is about as big as the transmitter. It was also in an interesting tan color. The ones I had previously heard about uh, were gray. Here's a picture uh, of two Italian radio operators in a German radio van that has a LO40K39 transmitter on the right. The power supply is over on the left. And in between are two Torny B receivers, which were the most common German army receivers of World War II. Now, the transmitter that I was able to pick up uh, first of all, it was missing its nice glass magnifying lens. But what concerned me the most were the white paint markings uh, diagonally on the front panel. So I certainly wish they weren't there. Now, you know, since then, I kind of pondered this EEIS thing. And, um, you know, EE to me probably meant something like electrical engineering. You know, and I'd seen lots of equipment for, uh, at flea markets that came from schools or universities or company EE labs. Um, but um, anyway, uh, you know, again, the thought was the markings devalue the radio and it's going to be very difficult to clean off. Um, also, you know, the format of this is EEIS and then XXX, XXX. So, Back in 2017, there wasn't a lot written about the EEIS, but if you go to Wikipedia now, you find out that it stands for the Enemy Equipment Intelligence Service, which located enemy uh, equipment of all types, large and small, from aircraft and tanks down to pieces of clothing and uh, individual uh, pieces of ammunition. And um, they did this to evaluate uh, and sometimes to instruct allied personnel on how to use or reuse. And later on, uh, it says the EEIS switched its focus from military hardware to industrial equipment in Germany in general. So these were the monuments men of enemy military technology. And they were active in all theaters, all campaigns, um, um, working very closely with the uh, front assault groups um, and examining everything that they uh, came upon. And, you know, if it, was, uh, if it was common and reusable, they would help to reuse it. If it was unique, they'd write it up, send it to the rear uh, for further study. If it was really, really unique, it would be sent all the way back to the United States for detailed analysis. Um, so we could learn about this, learn about the uh, enemy's capabilities, and maybe even get some ideas on how to improve our equipment. Here was a great win in North Africa. The German Tiger tanks uh, showed up in a in very small quantity uh, during the last part of that campaign. Here's one we captured and, and sent home. Uh, here's a very interesting Japanese 75 millimeter mountain gun, which was made to be easily taken apart and carried to very inaccessible places uh, by men or men and animals. So um, it was a nice find. Of course, radar was a high uh, priority um, target um, throughout World War II. And here's a mention of an EEIS team investigating the German radar school in France and finding valuable pieces of equipment. It wasn't just ordnance or, or um, signals equipment that was, uh, uh, they looked at everything, including medical. Um, the Germans had some very nice medical instruments. 
uh, bandages and plasters uh, and dental equipment that we um, learned from. The Japanese were actually ahead of us in water purification equipment since they were, uh, they already had troops stationed throughout the Pacific on uh, islands with, with very lousy water. Even clothing was examined. Um, if you've ever owned a German field jacket, there's a string through the center of it that you can tighten. And that came from a, uh, a German, that was a German idea that we adopted. Also uh, a big problem was making a piece of field uniform, um, waterproof and breathable at the same time. Um, and uh, the Germans uh, um, solved this problem early on with different layers of, of different materials and different weaves that would um, close up as uh, the first bit of moisture got to it. And um, so anyway, um, we learned from this as well. Uh, EEIS team members were technical technical consultants on uh, enemy equipment. They accompanied the assault forces, set up at headquarters, and they looked for anything that had immediate tactical use to um, their situation there. Uh, they inspected enemy equipment, uh, wrote preliminary reports, and uh, forwarded the equipment on to rear areas for testing. Um, the best stuff was sent to the US for detailed intelligence analysis. Um, they also used uh, common equipment for training to, um, for new troops in the theater. And, uh, and if it was found in quantity and uh, usable as is, um, they helped with the repurposing. In a lot of cases, um, enemy equipment was common, well-known and um, interoperable uh, with what we had. Uh, things like uh, vehicles and telephone poles and wire, uh, some radio sets, um, switchboards, um, fuels, vehicles, that type of thing. And in some cases, um, German items were better than what we had. And the EEIS teams assisted in the training of people so they could reuse uh, captured units. Um, so they trained um, troops on using enemy equipment. Here's um, an, um, some folks learning how to use the 88 millimeter gun. Here's a uh, demonstration of a Japanese flamethrower being done for uh, a new troops. Um, um, also mines and booby traps were, were also very important to be trained on. There was a tremendous volume of marked items shipped to the United States, certainly mostly ordnance and weapons, but uh, a, a number of radio equipment, pieces of radio equipment, um, anything that we might uh, uh, learn from, anything that was relatively unknown. So the, one of the tenets of this presentation is that if you happen to come across a piece of radio equipment marked with an EEIS number, it's something special. It was important enough to be sent back to the United States for evaluation and write-up. It's quite possibly the first of its kind to be seen and captured, uh, or at least it's a, it was a new model or a new version at the time. So this unique identification number is provenance and should not be wiped off. And since becoming EEIS aware, I've been looking around for more marked examples. And so far I've only found radio items, but I would certainly welcome any, any, uh, anything with an EIS marking on it. Here's an item I spotted on eBay. If you've ever listened to a non-directional beacon on VLF uh, uh, from your local airport, this is what uh, uh, in the German Luftwaffe, they had these uh, keyers, these automatic keyers that were programmable to send either a two letter or a three letter code over and over um, uh, to identify the uh, airport um, on radio. So this is a nice unit. Someone's tried to wipe off these markings, but uh, couldn't, so they're selling it as it was. Here, um, a pic this picture came from a uh, German reenactor Facebook group. It's a F-U-H-E-D, uh, one of a series of intercept receivers 
This particular one covers the low band VHF. And you can see the EEIS markings right in the middle of the main tuning dial. And I'm sure the owner wishes they weren't there. Here's a picture of a, a very rare late model uh, portable uh, German army set um, called a TFUG I, I model, one of the last models made. And I'd never seen one before. And it's uh, nicely marked with that unique EEIS number. Here's part of a um, optical light powered point to point telephone communication system um, that um, is also uh, marked with a EEIS number on the side. I was, I, I was sent this picture from a different collector who happens to have part of the power supply for that uh, previous device. Uh, so I need to put those two guys together. And here's a, um, a power supply for a more common uh, German uh, field radios. And you can still see the EEI on the, on the case. Now it wasn't just German radios, it was any enemy equipment. Here's a uh, Japanese radio hand crank generator, nicely marked. And here's a very interesting uh, uh, loop, uh, Japanese Army Brown. Uh, with an EEIS number on it. I assumed it was part of a radio um, direction finding unit. I emailed Taka in, uh, in Japan at the, at the Japanese Military Radio Museum in Yokohama. And he sent me this nice postcard of uh, the entire unit in, in work, in use, and, uh, and told me that it was actually a system used to detect Enemies high voltage put on barbed wire, which kind of blows my mind. So I don't think we had anything like that. Um, here's uh, what looks like a German field phone, and they were very, very common and commonly captured, but it's actually a uh, last resort uh, bunker radio, Fortress Emergency Transmitter B. Um, also note that uh, it has a U.S. Signal Corps tag attached to it as well. I would love to see the other side of that tag. Here's the inside of this bunker radio, just to show that it's uh, definitely not a field phone. Very rare item, I'm told. Here's a very big uh, aircraft um, uh, direction finding receiver. And um, I had never seen one of these before until a collector friend of mine sent me a picture of his. And there's the EEIS markings right front and center on the dial. I was surprised when I, uh, another friend of mine sent me a picture of his Torn EB with uh, EEIS markings. Again, the Torn EB was probably the most common German army receiver used throughout the war. So, I'm thinking this is probably one of the first examples that were captured by the US. Now, many of the German uh, and Japanese radios were interoperable um, if we had translated instructions. Um, and that's true, I collect German and Japanese radios to some extent, and one of the holdups, uh, you know, one of the reasons why a lot of people don't collect these radios is because they, uh, they don't have a translated manual. So uh, I think the EEIS was involved in producing uh, manuals uh, written in English. Um, there was a series of War Department technical bullets, uh, 25 uh, different uh, um, mini manuals um, produced during the war on different radio, different German and Japanese radio sets. And I, I think, but I can't prove it yet, that they're the results of EEIS study, but I'm, I'm working on that. Here's uh, six of the German uh, uh, TB SIGs that I've found so far. Before the sun gets to them, they're more of that uh, green gray color that's up in the top left uh, example. So, and the Japanese ones are, are more of a light blue. So um, the Wikipedia article mentioned that uh, later in the war, the EEIS switched their focus to industrial equipment. 
here's a big piece of industrial equipment that uh, that's in a, a friend's collection. And um, it's a relay tester. And it's in a very large transit case. Um, and here's some of the markings um, seen on the outside of that transit case. First, there's an EEIS number. And some of the writing says from EEIS team 11 signal section, and then to Washington, DC. So all that makes sense. Here's a huge piece of, uh, of hardware in another friend's collection, believe it or not. And he says it's a piece of uh, uh, a radar component off of a U-boat. And uh, if you look very closely, you can also see the EEIS uh, unique uh, serial number uh, on it. There's also other markings on this particular piece of gear, which tells me that other organizations also um, looked at and evaluated this. And I would, I would very much like to know, I've seen CEE a couple of times, especially with some other radar gear uh, or parts of radar gear. So I'd be very open if anybody has any other markings uh, uh, or knows, knows of any. Here is a whole collection of Jap Japanese army radios that were captured during the Gilbert Islands campaign in early 1944. And there's four or five different models um, represented here. I've circled one. It's a model 94 air ground radio receiver. And it's shown here um, with its much larger um, transmitter that went with it. Here's an Australian photograph of two Australian intelligence uh, men uh, firing up and uh, evaluating the motor generator set that actually goes to that particular transmitter uh, to understand how it works and also possibly repurpose it. And here's a photo of other Australian radio intelligence personnel uh, being shown uh, the insides of a, of a very special Japanese radio receiver. It's the Model 92 Special. There's an example in the AWA Museum, and I have one as well. It, um, it covers both BLF and HF um, thanks to its seven plug-in coils. Um, so it basically can cover the same frequencies as our Navy RAK and RAL, or uh, our Navy RBA, RBB, and RBC. And uh, this was used um, throughout the war. Uh, this was one of their best receivers. Um, this is shown here on, on Guadalcanal. Uh, they were captured. Uh, uh, for some reason, the Japanese uh, didn't destroy a lot of their equipment when they, when they um, were pushed back. I, I don't know if they thought they were gonna counterattack or, uh, or what. Here's a, uh, a picture of both sets of coils that were needed for one receiver. Now this particular receiver was designed for Japanese I boats um, or submarines um, in the 1935 timeframe, so. Here uh, are a large collection of Model 92s used on the cruiser. And I'm assuming they needed so many receivers because they, they did have plug-in coils and this way they wouldn't have to deal with that. Uh, so they just used more receivers. And if this is the number of receivers on the cruiser, it would be really interesting to see a picture of uh, uh, the Model 92s on a uh, larger vessel, like a battleship or a, uh, even an aircraft carrier. Certainly uh, aircraft um, were very important um, during World War II. A lot of the Japanese equipment uh, was welded in into their planes and they couldn't easily, uh, couldn't easily be removed. And plus the, the components were uh, like an engine, for example, very heavy. So for a time, the US had what was called a jet plate program. They wanted, they encouraged GIs to find and turn in data plates. Um, and uh, there was a lot of information that could be gleaned from data plates, um, possibly the manufacturer, a product or a version number. Uh, if, if there was a serial number, 
It could be, uh, it would help with the quantity manufactured. All this information was used by the Americans and the British uh, in bombing decisions. So very important pieces of information. There was also legitimate ways of bringing um, souvenirs home during the war. Here's a torn EB in my collection with the uh, battery box on the bottom with the paperwork um, um, that was sent home with, with the radio. And um, this ensured that someone in, of an intelligence nature was able to um, uh, make sure that nothing unique or novel was being sent home. Um, only the common stuff uh, yeah, was allowed to be sent home. Uh, so here's some further reading. Uh, the best document I've found about the EES so far is called EES, the Battle of Enemy Equipment. Um, if you do want to look around for uh, or research the EEIS, be aware that the name of the organization changed. Originally, it was the Enemy Equipment Identification Service through mid-1943 and then changed to Enemy Equipment Intelligence Service after that. And in a lot of cases, uh, where you see EEIS, you also see ASF, which stands for Army Service Forces. So apparently the EEIS det detachments or units um, were part of what they called uh, Army Service Forces. Now, my next stop is to the National Archives. If you search their site um, on EEIS, you get lots and lots and lots of results, but unfortunately nothing's downloadable. Um, so I'm hoping to visit this year, uh, find interesting history and, uh, and hopefully some provenance, some reports written up on uh, a lot of receivers that I've shown you so far that most of which I don't own. So uh, it's gonna be interesting. Um, what I'm looking for, um, additional examples of EEIS marked items or tags, U.S. Navy, U.S. Signal Corps tags. I um, also would like to find the, the full set of original TB SIG technical bulletins, um, E1 through E25 to scan in. And uh, here's a picture of a Japanese one, which is kind of a, a, a bluish color. I've been told by a couple of people that there's a great two volume set um, on the history of the EEIS in World War II um, that was at Fort Monmouth, for example, at one time. Uh, no one seems to have these. Um, if you know of, of same, please let me know. And also, if you would, please spread the word. Don't clean off these markings on these radios. Special thanks to Tom Bryan, Lynn Hunter, and Hugh Miller for letting me have some of the pictures from their collection. I'm always looking for commonality. I like early nationals, radios with plug-in coils, um, pre-World War II civilian aviation radios, German and Japanese military radios, and manuals, especially English translations. Um, any uncommon radio with an interesting story or data tag. And, and just as importantly, I love pictures of vintage radios in use. So I like to um, collaborate with people. I like researching, presenting. Uh, here's my email address. Um, you know, how can I help you? And what are you looking for? So thanks again for watching and supporting the Antique Wireless Association.